on, all God's people said, amen and amen. Man, I'm, I'm excited to be in God's house, and, and I'm excited that you're here. Uh, you could be anywhere else in the world. Uh, we say this all the time, but you're here. Uh, you're in God's house, and man, we just uh, are excited uh, to have you here. Uh, we love that you're here, and we're going to gather together around God's word. We are in uh, a collection of, of talks right now that we're just simply calling uh, letters. We are looking at the first um, letter that Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and we are uh, asking the questions of what is God saying to them in there um, so that we might also understand what God is saying here and now, what God's saying to us in this letter. And I pray as you're, as you're reading it, as you are maybe spending some time throughout the week, as you are spending some time in the text, that you're allowing the text to challenge you, that you're allowing the text to encourage you, that you're allowing it to equip you and do all that God has intended for the text to do in your life uh, and in my life. Um, but we're going to gather together today around God's Word, and we're going to come to uh, chapter 8 in 1 Corinthians. Uh, are you ready for God's Word? Yes. Come on, I love it. I love it. So let's dive in uh, together today. We've got uh, two portions of Scripture that we're going to read together. And the first is uh, chapter 8, uh, beginning at verse 1. It says, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. But this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, Paul is responding to a situation, to a question that has been raised. Many, many times when we're, when we're moving through this text, I want us to keep that in mind. A lot of times Paul's not just coming up with stuff and he's not just throwing things out there. He has received correspondence from them. He's received word from them. And now he's responding to certain questions, certain incidences, things that are happening. And so now there is this question in their community. What are we to do with food that's offered to idols? Here we are. We are saved. We're set apart. God is doing a work in us. We're following Jesus. Now, how do we engage in cultural things that are happening and here's what Paul says to him. He says, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you have knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged? If his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols, and so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ has died. And thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ, and therefore the food makes my brother stumble. I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Now before all of you become vegetarians, let's make sure we can we'll pass through this scripture here together quickly and see what the Lord says to us. But keep that in mind, and would you come now to me with, with chapter number 9, and let's read uh, from verse 19. This is Paul again saying to him, he says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became one as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who were under the law. And to those who were outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law the law. And to the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. Listen to what Paul says. I have become all things to all people that by all means 
I might save some. That's good enough to read again. He says, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessing. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, and I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Let's bow our heads and our hearts for prayer. Father, we love you. And Lord, we thank you for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Your word has the ability to divide. Your word has the ability to, to separate our desires, our inclinations for the call of God and the purpose and the plan of God in our life. Lord, we ask for the word to do what you have intended it to do. We don't want to get in the way of the working of the word in our life. So God, let our wills subside. Even let our own arrogance subside. And let the Holy Spirit rule and reign in our mind that we might become more like you. Form us into your image. And Lord, we thank you so much for all the things that you're doing. And God, we give you all of the praise now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So, so Paul is addressing that cultural tension up front. There are those that were formerly worshiping idols. One of the things that Paul says over and over is, you used to be, but now you're not. And Paul says, listen, I, I know that some of you are going to find yourself in people's houses or at people's um, gatherings, and they may be serving some food that, that was at one time used in a ceremony towards an idol. And Paul says, hey, first and foremost, let's just be aware that that idol actually doesn't have the authority that they think that it does. And he says, so I don't want you to get tripped up on, on these ceremonial things. He says, in other words, listen. It doesn't matter if you eat it, it doesn't matter if you don't. He said, but what I want you to be aware of is the way in which you are living your life. I want you to be aware of the knowledge that you are treasuring and gathering and, and collecting. You see, over and over, the Corinthians would sort of say to one another, they would say to Paul, they would say really to anybody who would listen, but we have knowledge. We're, we're gathering knowledge, we're growing, we're accumulating knowledge. And, and it is this, this phrase, we have, we have knowledge. And Paul says, great, you have knowledge, but so what? What are you doing with it? And I love the, the phrase found early in the text. It is the first point that we'll land on this morning, but it's one that I, I think you should memorize it's one that I think you should keep close to your heart because I think it can help correct us in moments where we might be drifting and we might be straying away from the love of God that is to be on display in our life and is to be demonstrated with our life. Listen, we're not just to be those that look and seem like the love of God is in us, but we are to show the love of God in our lives. We are not just to be window treatments. We are actually to, to get out and to do and to have a sense and a purpose in what we do. And Paul says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I love that phrase. Knowledge puffs up. Come on, we all know it to be true. We've had the moments, we've been in a conversation, and we've possessed the piece of knowledge that the people that we were talking to did not possess. Some of you right now can feel that feeling of how great that feels on the inside of you. You're smiling just as much as I am. That moment where you can be like, gotcha. Uh, you didn't know? Let me share with you. And I think there's just a, there's a moment for us to be honest with ourselves. We spend a lot of our lives accumulating facts, a lot of our lives trying to gather information, a lot of our lives trying to, to take and synthesize all of these things and then live in a, in a way that is wise. One of my favorite authors, Eugene Peterson, says that wisdom is actually skill in living. 
So what we want to do is we want to get this information. We want to get this knowledge. We want to gather all these things. And then we hopefully can arrive at a place of wisdom where we can live skillfully. But I want you to hear what Paul says. It's not enough. And it's the wrong endeavor for you and I just to try to gather and gain knowledge and information as if that is the highest level or calling for your life or for mine. Paul says, great. Knowledge puffs up. Knowledge has a way of feel, feeling and arrogance. Knowledge has a way of, of getting you to feel as if you are kind of on your own. Love will always push you towards other people. And this is precisely what Christ has done for us and desires to do through us. So think about this just for a moment in your life. How are you demonstrating the love of Jesus in your life? Are you leading people closer to Christ through your life? When's the last time that you led a person to faith? When's the last time that you help nudge someone closer and closer to the throne of grace? When's the last time that you took a lower position so that you might elevate others? You see what they're doing is they're gaining information. They're gaining knowledge. Paul's been getting onto them from the very beginning of this letter. In the very beginning, he says, listen, you want to be spiritual. You want to act as if you've arrived at this sort of spiritual ascent, that you're somehow greater than others. He said, when well, the reality is, he says, you're missing the point entirely. In the same way that he challenged them in the beginning. He's challenging them again. He's used this phrase over and over about things that sort of puff them up. And the latest thing that had happened in, in, in chapter 5, Pastor Deshaun kind of breezed right by it. But he said that you're, there's an arrogance around the sin that is taking place in the body of Christ. There's an arrogance. There's a puffed up sense. And he says, listen, we're not supposed to be gaining knowledge. We're supposed to be growing in love. When we grow in the knowledge of God, it actually produces a love in us. And here's what the love looks like. Love for us is a word that is powerful. But for us in our English translations, we, we have one word that we use for love. And, and think about the ways in which it falls short. I love my wife. I met Nicole when I was 16 years old. And there hasn't been a day since the time I met her that I have not been in love with that girl. I'm in love with that girl. Like, um, shout out to JT. And so I, I love her. She's my baby's mama. She's my high school sweetheart. Like she's the, she's the one and only. Love her. Love her deeply. Love her so much more now than I did when we got married. Like, man, I love her. Also love tacos. <laughs> like I love tacos, guys. I mean, tacos are great. Hey, sometimes there's hard days in marriage, but tacos are soft. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I mean, we love tacos. Like I, right, right now, I'm ready for lunch. I'm ready to go get said tacos. But, but think about this. If we're not careful, we, we, we miss the nuances. We miss the strength. And we talk about love. And in the Greek, there were different words that were used for different types of love, and you were able to sort of understand what the person was talking about based on the type of word that they used. And when Paul talks about love, he, he talks about this love that is known as agape, that there's this love that is not like the other types. It, it has a distinction, and there's a difference. And, and as you think about this word, I, I, love, I love how he says this. He says, it's to give up. This type of love gives up. This type of love is to help. This type of love builds up others. This is the type of love that we see demonstrated in Christ. And so think about this. Is your life, is my life more focused on gathering and gaining or is it focused on surrendering and becoming like Jesus? Because if it's not focused on that, then we are precisely what Paul was correcting in the Corinthians. He says, listen, you've got to change your behavior. Stop letting your mind fool you into thinking that your soul is more healthy than it actually is. 
And then he goes on to tell them, he says, listen, there are going to be some of you, you're, you're not going to have an issue when it comes to, there's going to be a strength in you and in your, and in your relationship with Christ. There's going to be a strength and it's going to afford you a, some liberty, but the liberty isn't to be used for the expense or at the expense of someone else. So I was reading this and I was struck with a memory uh, that I had. I grew up in, in central Florida and as many of you know, and Grew up in the shadow of Mickey Mouse and just down the street from Shamu. And I remember, um, I remember when Universal Studios opened. Like I, rem- I remember when it opened. I remember the rides. I remember how excited we were. And, and a part of the, the development was that there was also a, a restaurant that was put in place um, right at the, the, the very in- entryway. And it was sort of a, a big deal. And it was, the, it was the Hard Rock Cafe. Some of you are, are familiar with this. And the Hard Rock Cafe is, is part museum, um, part mediocre food, um, and then the other part is just very expensive, right? And those three things, if you want to know what Orlando is like, um, there it is. It's those three things gathered around um, a great time. And so, but I remember it. I remember going in there and you, on one wall, you have like Elvis's comb that he used for his hair. And then the other wall, there's like a microphone that, you know, somebody else used. And there's, there's a jacket that like Arnold Schwarzenegger was wearing. And like all these sort of things were on the, the wall, like this memorabilia and you're, you're eating there. But the thing that I remembered is when you would enter the restaurant, they would give you, a, they would give you a, like a pin or a button. And I remember because we would put these pins and our buttons on our jean jackets. And we were um, very cool. And so... And then they would have different locations and you could collect them, right? You would get the different pins from like different locations. But what I remember is that they had the way of capturing, unbeknownst to them probably, unbeknownst to them, they had a way of capturing the gospel message in a simple way that I think we as the church could, could embrace and grab hold of. And their phrase, their slogan at the time, not sure if it still is today, was love all and serve all. Love all, serve all. I just thought, I was like, man, that's a really... It's a really good way of, of saying that. It's a good way of capturing what the gospel calls us to do. Paul says, don't grow in intellectual prowess, but grow in love. And the way in which you know that you are strong, the way in which you know that you are a person who is maturing in your faith and in your walk with Jesus is not known in what you know, but it's, in, it's known in the way in which you love. And Paul says the way in which you love is demonstrated in your willingness to surrender your own rights and your own liberties for the sake of someone else. Paul says this, if you're not careful, your liberties, if you're not careful, your freedoms, things that you don't have as a matter of conscience may cause someone else to stumble. And Paul wants to make it abundantly clear to them. And I hope that we'll hear this as well. And it'll be abundantly clear to us. We need to take note of our life and how it's affecting other people. Are the decisions you're making causing others to move closer to Christ or is it causing others to be indifferent or is it causing others to maybe push away from who Jesus is? Because our calling is to bring people into relationship with Jesus. Help them, help them to understand the Christ that has come and died for them and been raised into new life. And Paul says this in, He says, I became all things to all people. Why? So that I might win some. So that I might win some. Paul was willing, was willing to never have another Philly cheesesteak sandwich for his entire life. If that meant he would be able to reach other people. Here's the question I have for all of us. What sacrifices are we willing to make in our life right here, right now, in order for others to know the message of who Jesus is? What surrenders? What, what give-ups? What reductions are we willing to make so that others might come to Christ? Or has your relationship with Jesus solely been about your own personal experience? Your own personal salvation? Your own personal deliverance? It needs to be those things initially, but it has to quickly mature beyond just our personal and into a mission and a purpose that we are here to reach those with the message of Jesus. 
He says we're called to love all. We're called to serve all. Paul wants them to know and wants them to be very, very clear that their freedoms, their freedoms may be the thing that's hurting those who are weaker. He wants them to know that, that we should be viewing people that we're coming in contact with in our life, that these are people who Jesus died for. Think about how that changes our interactions with people. Think about that changes the way in which we care for others. Think about that changes the way in which we, we move in our lives. Is if we were to see each person as they are someone, not only who was created in the image of God, but they are someone in whom Jesus died for. It changes everything. It changes the way I interact with the person whose belief system is so far away from where mine is. It changes the way in which I move in the areas that God has called me to and he's positioned us and he's, he's purposed us. It changes that. Why? Because the outcome is not that I might win, but the outcome is that I might win them to Christ. Have you gotten to the place in your life where what you're trying to accomplish is more about you than it is about accomplishing the cause of Christ in the earth. I love what Paul says. I became all things to all men. And then he uses an analogy that everyone in that culture would have completely understood the same way that we do. He understood that they would be preparing for games very, very similar to the Olympics. And that these games, people would win a perishable wreath or a prize. They are going through incredible effort to get something that's going to fade away. And Paul says, listen, he says, I'm, I'm running a race. I'm fighting a fight that is much different because I'm not trying to gain something that's going to fade away and pass away, but I'm trying to gain something that is imperishable. And notice what he says. He says, I want to be careful that I don't, after having preached this gospel, that I, that I fall away from myself. And if we're not careful, we'll read this, and, and in passing, we read it, and we go, man, Paul was scared that he was going to, like, miss heaven. And I, and I want you to hear what, is, what the text is actually saying. Paul's not worried that he's going to lose his grip in Christ's hand. Paul's more concerned that the way in which he goes about it is going to be more for his glory than God's. Now, that's sobering for us. Because many of us in our life, we get caught up thinking about, man, I just don't want to lose Christ's grip that he has on my life. And we don't mature into the thought of, listen, it's not necessarily thinking about whether or not we're losing our grip and Christ's grip on us. It's not necessarily about that. But it is about, are we living our life in such a way where we are taking all the glory, where we are demonstrating that it was in our own strength and our own ability? Or are we saying, listen, I'm doing all of these things but I'm doing them so that Christ might be glorified and his name be made known. Do you track with me today, church? All right, let me give you the, the final thing that I want you to grab hold of, and I want to I wanna sit on this one just for, for a few moments if we can. And the third one, if you'll write it down, it's simply this. Uh, idols and the demons behind them. Idols and the demons behind them. Paul, Paul talks about this in... Chapters 8, 9, and 10, he references idols. He references them and he wants the people to understand that these idols don't in and of themselves have power. He goes on to say that not, not only do they not have power, he says, but I do want you to be aware of the forces of darkness, the demons, the demonic that, that operates in the shadows behind those trinkets that are created. You see, many of us, if we're not careful, we... We hear the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We, we know them. We shall not have idols. We, not, we shall not make idols for ourselves. We, we, we've, heard, we've heard these commandments. And yet we haven't paid careful attention to our life on the idols that we've acquired or the, even the idols that we've built in our own self. Just because it's become more convenient just because it's culturally acceptable. 
And I really want us to understand, listen, the idolatry isn't necessarily about the thing. It's about what's operating behind the thing. And how the enemy desires for craves that our attention, our worship, our affection, our devotion would be taken off of Christ and it would be put somewhere that is inappropriate. Hear me on this, friends. Your devotion, if it is not to Christ and Christ alone, is inappropriate. It's, it's a misappropriation of devotion. So I want to offer you this. As I was praying and thinking this week of different idols in our lives, listen to me, we could, we could spend a lot of time and we could list out a lot of things that we can build out. And, and there, there were three that I, that I landed on. And I was, as I was praying, I just want to offer these to you. Because listen, I think we also have to understand and consider the counterfeit. What, is, what it's trying to do to us. And, and I pray that the Lord would, would speak to us in this. And the first one is, is this. The idol of our ability. Ability, when I think about that, ability is what, is what I can do. It's what we can do in our own strength. And I think that idol is our own strength. It's our own capability. It's our own, I got this. That emotion, that feeling, that satisfaction that we get when we, when we do it on our own and we don't need any other help and we, and we start buying into that narrative and we start living to that script. What it does is it pulls us away from a surrendered life to Jesus. Can I tell you what no idol has ever said to me in my life? No idol has ever said to me that I must come and die. No idol has ever said that. No idol has never said to me that I must crucify my flesh. No idol has ever told me that I must conform to the image of Jesus. No idol has never said that to me. You know what the idols in my life have said to me? You're doing good, keep it up. You're doing good, keep it up. Distraction is a beautiful tool of the idols in our life. They're distracting us from the glory of God. They're distracting us from who God is and they're getting us to just make peace with our own ability. Now hear the word that counterbalances this. Philippians 4.13, many of you know this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. When the idol of your own ability begins to swell in your life and you begin to lean in your own understanding and you begin to, to think that you've got it, just get to a place where you let that verse and you let that word come out of your soul. Can I just tell you this is why we need to be people who memorize the scriptures? So that when certain situations, when, when certain temptations in life, and many of us, we think that temptations only comes of, in ways of seduction. Oh, friend, wake up. Temptation comes to us, not just in ways of seduction and sexuality, but temptation comes to us in ways that makes us think we're better than we actually are. And the idol of our ability is the one where we, we lean into it and we fuel it with our own ego. Sometimes the voices of others that are praising you are the very thing that's keeping you from actually giving honor and glory to God because you are unwilling to let go of the applause. You're, willing, you're not willing to... And if those are our feelings and those are moments that you're having, this is the sign. Tear that thing down. And the way in which we do that is let the word erupt out of your heart. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Listen to me, friend. I'm not trying to, give you, to, to get you to live a life that is less. I'm just trying to get you to live a life that depends on you less. To live a life that is dependent upon, not your ability, but dependent on your vulnerability and your surrendered posture to the Lord, where you would say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When you hear the applause of others, may you turn it, may you turn it to him. Now, don't do it in a goofy way. Somebody tells you, good job, say thank you. And then say, man, I'm just grateful for what the Lord's doing, the opportunity that he's given, the way that he's graced, and his strength that's guiding me. Are you tracking with me? 
Please don't be the person that can't receive a compliment. It drives me crazy. Well, I just, you know, it's like, it, you're not that humble. You're telling on yourself, you're not that humble. Okay? So the first idol is, is the, of your ability. The, the, the second one, I think it's the idol of our will. When I think about our will, I think about our desire. And that desire being our driving force. And the idol of our will keeps us from a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Keeps us from a surrendered posture with the Holy Spirit. I love reading the Gospels and I love where Jesus says, I don't say anything that I haven't heard my father say. Whew. That's, that's living a life of, in, in rhythm and in tune. I don't say anything that I haven't heard my father say. Whew. Man. I think about the times in my life I've said real dumb things. Ugh. Think about the times in my life where I let what I wanted dictate the timing versus what God wanted in his timing. Listen to me, your desire, if it's not surrendered and if it's not pulled under, under grace, under mercy, under the lordship of Jesus, under the guiding of the Holy Spirit, our desires, can we just be honest, are going to lead us in a mess of places. Going to lead us in a mess of places. Listen to the counterbalance. Listen to the word in this. Romans 8, 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Children of God. Do you know one of the ways in which you can, you can determine whether or not you are living in relationship with God? that you are a child of God? Are you led by the Spirit? Or are you led by your own desires? Want to know one of the ways of spiritual practice and how you tear down this idol? Fasting. Tell yourself no. Some of you, the fast that you need to go on, some of you fasting foods, like, that's easy. And you, you're like, man, I could, I could do a liquid fast tomorrow. This is great. I give me a smoothie. Man, I'm good. Cool. You might need to fast consumerism. You might need to fast just satisfying every desire and whim that you have. Some of you don't tell yourself no. Some of you have people that tell you no all the time. But some of you, if you, if you had your way, you would say yes to yourself all the time. Can we just say out loud how dangerous that is? So here's your homework this week. Tell yourself no. Tell yourself no for no good reason other than the fact that you are going to control your desires. All right? That's our homework. We're going to do that together, right? Yes? Four of you. Um, point made. Um, it also reminds me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul's already said this to them, but listen to his words again. He said, in my speech and my message were not a plausible words of wisdom but in the demonstration of the Spirit's power. Listen to me. You want to have a demonstration of the Spirit's power in your life? Stop living according to your own desires. Stop living driven by your desires and live led by the Spirit so that you might demonstrate the works of the Spirit among the people that God has placed you in. You track with me. Here's the third one that I want us to pay attention to. Our credentials, our, our, our achievements, as access grantors. I remember when I was in a degree, one of my degree programs, and um, I remember a professor saying this to me, and it was a, I think it's a true statement, but I think it's a dangerous statement. And let's unpack it together. I remember him saying to me, he said, Charlie, degrees are keys that you get to add to your key ring that open doors that previously were shut to you. He said, every time you get one of these, every time you, you go through this process, you get a new set of keys to add on to it, and there's more doors that are open to you. I'm just telling you, man, at like 18, 19 years old, I'm like, man, I want janitor keys. You know what I'm saying? Give me all them keys. And if we're not careful, what we do is we think that it's the credentials that we've gathered that's giving us authority, that's giving us position, that's giving us the, the platform that that has been entrusted to us. And listen to me, that is a dangerous, 
dangerous pursuit. This one is the one that I think really connects into what the, the people in Corinth were doing. Just want to gather knowledge, want to gather knowledge, want to gather knowledge, want to gather knowledge. As if it's the knowledge that's doing the work. Man, it is the grace of God on your life. I want to be a voice that says that to you over and over in a place that is filled with high achievers, in a place that is filled with drivers, a place that is filled with people that are doing good and are, are motivated with noble causes and noble purposes. Man, I, I want you to hear of, uh, from me honor. I honor that in you. But I also at the same time want you to hear the other side of this coin. Be careful. Because it is not the accumulation of your credentials that is giving you access, but it is the Lord's hand who is on your life, leading you and guiding you. The idol of your credentials is one that would never give honor and glory to God. The idol of your credentials will keep you feeling like you have to open the door and you have to keep the door open and you have to be the one that sustains you. Are you track with me? Any door that you open, you have to keep open. But if you live your life as one who's not holding the key ring, understanding that it is, it is the Lord's. Let me give you the scripture counterbalance for this. This idol is an idol of works. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Look at verse 24 again. But let those who boast in this, that he understands and he knows me, and don't boast in the things in which you've accumulated. Don't boast in the things in which you, you have or you don't have. Boast in the Lord. Boast in the Lord. And be the person that recognizes, if not for the grace of God, go I. But also be the person that says, man, it's the grace of God that keeps me and sustains me. It's the grace of God that placed me here. That it's the grace of God at work. We have to be ruthless in the tearing down of our idols, not because our lives are cluttered with the trinkets. It's because the demonic forces that are at work behind them. When your devotion is taken off of Christ and it's placed onto anything else, you and me, friends, then become susceptible to the demonic influences in our life. What if I told you it wasn't Harry Potter you needed to worry about? What if I told you it was you? What if I told you the greatest threat to idolatry in your life isn't what someone else is going to do to you? It's what you allow to happen in your own life. And my prayer, friends, is that we would not stand for it. Paul reminds them, he echoes the, the beautiful language of the verses in Deuteronomy. He says, he says, there's one Lord. There's one God. His name is Jesus. And this who has our affection, this is who has our attention and our devotion. Would you bow your heads? Would you pray with me today?